<laughs> Everyone's really excited. Um, there's lots of space in the front if you would like to come up here to sit down. Um, if you're standing at the back, there's sp space up here unless you want to get your steps in. Um, cool. So welcome to our presentation. Um, this is Masters of the Universe, live coding a React application using Drupal services. Um, this is going to be a live demo, so there may be some excitement and some thrills. Uh, we ask that you leave your questions, comments, and tips until the end, unless I'm crying, in which please come and help. <laughs> or if you want to help with the coding, you know, that's fine. Yeah, that's too. fine too. Just chime in. Um, cool. So, um, what we'll cover, uh, this is just a large overview. Um, we're going to be talking about who the people up here are, um, what progressively decoupled is, and how we use it. Um, I'm going to give a light touch on React licensing because I know it's a sensitive subject. Um, and then we're going to actually go through the build process uh, in terms of um, how do we define kind of the data structure, how do we set up Drupal, and how do we set up React. Uh, if you're an expert at this, this will probably old, be old hat to you. But if you've never encountered this before, we're going to give a really high level overview to understand how you could actually build these tools yourself. So. Um, the intention is, is that this isn't a deep dive, this isn't a uh, complex discussion of something, but it's uh, kind of like a cooking show. <laughs> I'm not gonna like chop the carrots, <laughs> but we'll, we'll show you how it's done. And if ever, anything goes wrong, we do have the finished turkey at the end that we'll pull out. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that'll be the razzle dazzle that we're looking for. Cool. Um, so I'm Justin Longbottom. Uh, I'm a Drupal developer with MyPlanet. Uh, we're based in Toronto. Uh, I've been doing Drupal development for about seven, about seven years, I guess. Uh, lately, been kind of experimenting more with uh, progressive decoupling, uh, using React to do that, um, embedding that into our web pages to provide rich experiences. Um, and yeah, those are my uh, my Twitter handle and D.O profile. So follow me, add me. Uh, some of the, the the repo that I'll be using later, it's not public right now, but the goal is to eventually get to that point. So you know, watch for me on Twitter, and I'll tweet when that's ready to go. It's also his birthday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite the birthday present, so hopefully everything goes well. <laughs> um, I'm Aaron Marchak. Uh, I am a Drupal practice lead at my planet. We're out of Toronto. Um, and I focus on uh, building out Drupal teams, mentoring users, and embedding on the teams as um, a technical architect so I can work with people and learn and develop their skills. So the idea of learning and uh, introducing new people to different things in Drupal is really important to me. Um, you can, again, Twitter and D.O. Up, are up there. If you have any questions or are confused about any of the resources or anything, please follow up with us on there. We're always happy to chat. Cool. So what is progressively decoupled? Um, we've heard a lot about it. It's been kind of kicking around the community for over two years, so it's kind of done. Uh, not done, but like, um, it's well used and well known. Established. Established, thank you. <laughs> um, and what it does is it allows us to embed decoupled applications on a standard Drupal page. Um, so there's components of the page that are uh, decoupled, that are rendered using client-side technology that allow us to um, kind of maintain the authoring experiences of a classical CMS. If you work with users that are used to the Drupal UI and how that's kind of patterned in any kind of version control or workflowing, you still have that using um, a progressively decoupled approach because it's so closely tied into um, the classical CMS. If you use panels, um, you'll still be able to use panels because decoup progressive decoupling doesn't necessarily uh, exclude any of those uh, standard technologies that we're used to. Um, and you can use it to um, utilize the ex experiential benefits of the modern web. We're used to app-like interfaces, we're used to personalization, we're used to customization, and we're used to really snappy, sexy things on the internet. Um, and so you can still provide that to your users without actually abandoning any of the SEO, archiving, accessible or accessibility, or any of the other benefits of the classical CMS. The other double benefit um, is create once, publish everywhere. So if you create a uh, progressively decoupled experience, you're creating a backend that publishes an API, which we'll show you how to do, um, and that API can be consumed by your decoupled application. It can be consumed by a third party. You can pipe it into another um, interface, however you want to choose, but it allows others 
to actually access and participate in the API. When we do a decoupled um, or a progressively decoupled site, we frequently reuse API endpoints between different uh, areas of the site so we can pull in information and reuse content. And then we can also share that with um, third parties that want to either consume or syndicate our content. Additionally, uh, with a progressively decoupled approach, you can personalize content really easily um, without pulling in third party integration. <coughs> Lift. Um, that uh, it allows you to personalize on the client side, so you're still serving content through varnish, through caching, through any CDN that you have. But the client experience is a personalization without the full kind of bootstrap cost of a session that would allow you to, or that would require you to bypass varnish. Um, Finally, one of the benefits that we have is it allows really diverse development teams to work in parallel with one another. If you have a team that perhaps isn't used to Drupal but is very used to uh, any kind of front-end framework, then uh, you can actually start building in parallel with each other, having parallel sprints, and it means that as long as you're able to coordinate your efforts, and I'll show you how to do that, um, you can actually uh, <laughs> multi-thread your development processes, so, which is a little ridiculous. Um, the example that I have here is from a travel website that we do, and a lot of the progressively decoupled um, pieces that uh, we work with are very similar to views, filters. It allows users to kind of interact as a catalog. Um, it's a little bit faster uh, than you would with a traditional whole round trip to the server interface. So this interface here, you can see in a standard environment, I would build that with views. Um, this goes across America, and you can search different things here, but uh, because it's decoupled, when I search, um, it actually changes the interface really, really quickly. Oh, come on. There we are. Okay, I, I had to start doing it. And you can see how the numbers start changing. Um, the price I can change really quickly. I can search by Alaska. There's no more trips to Alaska right now. Um, but it's really quite fast for the user. And so um, when building these rich applications, you can to cater to the user and you can give them that exciting experience that they're used to and that uh, frequently if you're doing any kind of high-end products or really um, cutting edge stuff they're demanding while still also leveraging the benefits of Drupal. Boop. Okay, so React licensing. Um, who here is aware of the React licensing? Raise your hand. Ooh, okay. Um, so there's a few things out there. So React is released with a BSD license, so it is quote unquote open source, but it does come with what's called an additional patent writer. And what Facebook has done is it adds an additional clause to the license. It means that um, out of the gate, this is not compatible with Drupal's license, so it's not really suitable if you're looking to use it for any kind of contributed work or any kind of work actually that you want to host on Drupal.org, um, it's in violation of that license, so it cannot be hosted on Drupal.org. So it, it might not be suitable for a lot of different contributed projects that you're using. It's for sure not suitable in core, but it may be suitable for the work that you're doing individually with your projects, if it's custom work. In general, I highly recommend asking a legal advisor if it's pertinent to you. Because it's a patent uh, writer, it's specifically focusing on intellectual property rights and patents, and that's so contextual and so specific to the work that you're doing that you really need to ha understand what's happening and understand how to use it. So moral of the story, take it with a grain of salt. It's a really great tool to use, but we need to have an awareness of what kind of legal implications are there. Cool. Disclaimer done. Oh, no. No. It didn't work. Okay, so what are we building? A blue screen of death. That's just our lives now. Okay, cool, that's fine. No, 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 let's get going. What are we building? Um, so what we're actually gonna show you today is a uh, progressively decoupled Drupal application in which I will be programming the back end with a custom API endpoint and Justin will be programming the front end. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Um, and what, how we do this normally in production is uh, when we start off a project and we know that there's going to be two teams in parallel that are building together, we define a common uh, data structure. We define a language. Um, you can do this with something as formal as a JSON manifest. Um, you can do this 
you can commit the version of it. You can also scribble it on the back of a napkin. But in the end, it's setting the team's expectations. So as the two teams work together to meet an, at a common goal, they're actually, they understand what they need to do and how they need to um, communicate. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a little CoverFlow album interface. And Justin and I have chatted. Um, I'm going to send him the title of my album, the artist of my album is a string, the year it was released, and then a URL path to the cover. Um, so we just kind of define it there, and we're going to use the get method. Um, and once we have that, then we can start working together to actually build it in. Cool. Sweet. So this is the fun part where the screen goes. I'm going to actually set up Drupal for you. Boop, boop, boop. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sweet. So what we use um, to set up Drupal is actually, we've actually open sourced our scaffolding system. So if you go to packages.org, my planet Skeletor, uh, which is the reason why this thing is Masters of the Universe, um, is uh, we have a small installation profile that extends uh, what um, Drupal Composer does and we've customized it to our own use cases. So in here you can find some examples of how to properly set up and extend uh, post install hooks with Composer and a few other tweaky tweaks. I have not trusted the Wi-Fi here, so I already installed it, <laughs> which is fine. Um, so I have my Drupal site. I have installed uh, my Planet Skeletor. It's pretty easy to install it. You just do Composer, Create Project, My Planet Skeletor, and it'll bootstrap everything for you. Um, I have already <coughs> installed this site, and I've made a little module. Mm -hmm. In my modules folder. So I have it under doc root, I have it under modules. I made a little custom module called Masters of the Universe. Cute. And within here, I've installed a node. Do, do, do. And here I have my album. I've installed it with uh, some config. I have a body. I have the artist title as text. I have the cover image. And I have field released. So what I'm going to do, at this point I have a handful of bits of content within here. I need to log into the site. So I'm going to use my little script here. Woo. Drupal user login URL one to see the bit of content. Um, so if you haven't encountered this before, this is Drupal console. It's sweet. It's really fast and it helps you scaffold tool, uh, different tools. I'm going to be using one command mostly, which is the uh, generate rest resource to actually show you how to build your own rest resource. Cool. Sweet. Logging in, I have my site. Anyway. So uh, the first step in towards building a back end is to obviously generate an endpoint um, for your front end to actually hit. Uh, and in Drupal 8, uh, what we, how we can do that and how we're going to be building it here is by using a custom REST resource. Um, there's lots of different ways of doing it. We found that custom REST resources are uh, more suitable to our needs, especially when dealing with uh, large data sets. And I'll go over kind of the pros and cons of them. But step one, once I have my site, ah, I have to install my module. Step one, install module. Module Drupal module install masters of the Universe. <laughs> cool. And so it's installing uh, my field UI. I have the uh, REST that's out of core and some serialization. Um, everything that I'm using here is straight out of core. Um, so it's really easy for you to extend and build out. Great. So now that I have it, I should now see content type. Nice. And I'm going to generate some content with it. Drupal create nodes, just to kind of generate what's going to be in there so I have something to play with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So now I have some nodes. 
So let's actually generate the uh, REST resource. Drupal generate. Ah, thank you. Cool. So I'm going to generate a REST resource. Yeah, that's better. Um, and the awesome thing about Drupal console is it actually walks you through it with type hints and auto completion. So if you're not really sure about what's going on, you can step through it. On top of the fact, they have a learning flag. So when it does generate content, it'll generate more descriptive comments. So you can actually go through and see and understand what's happening. I like it. So uh, I'm going to give uh, the plugin rest resource name. Uh, what did I decide? Al bum rest resource. I'm going to call it albums. Sure, that's a human readable name. My URL is going to be API slash albums. Yeah. And I, it's just going to be a get because we're just going to be fetching it to build out our little cover flow view. Yes, please. I would like generate it. Oh, so fast. And you can see here in my module, boop, boop, I now have my album rest resource. Yay. Um, the one thing that I found uh, with generating this is that uh, when you generate a REST resource, you have to enable it. There is still some configuration. There is an awesome module called um, REST underscore UI that you can use to kind of control and clicky pointy and like go through all of it, which is great for exploration. I'm ridiculous, so I'm using Drupal console to do it. Drupal REST enable. Oh no, I did this before. Rebuild caches. And then you can start enabling it. <laughs> Drew, Drupal rest enable. Albums, you can see my autocorrect. I would like to enable it for my get method, which I've defined. And then I can actually control the format of the output of it, and it'll handle this automagically. Um, I'm going to use JSON because it's going to be consumed by the front end. And I can provide authentication, which is cookies, select authentication providers, and it's already enabled. The one thing that I will notice, or I will point out with this, is that um, when enabling REST resources, they are tied to user permissions. So after you enable it, you have to go to permissions and uh, access get on album rest resources. And that's really nice if you have multiple kind of levels of control, whether or not you want to have access, different users have access to different uh, parts of the endpoint, whether or not you're creating uh, or just reading content. Cool. Saving permissions. Sweet. So if I go here, uh, I use Postman to help me test uh, my API, API endpoints. You can do all sorts of cool authentication and headers. Here's what, in the end, we're going to build right here. You can see it's the same match, except um, this is a ridiculous artist name, and I don't know how to pronounce these hipster bands. <laughs> uh, but if I was to hit the endpoint right now, send, please. I need to flush caches. <coughs> Ooh, ooh, never mind. Don't see that. <laughs> Old habits. <are> hard. <laughs> okay. Um, while that's building, uh, what I'm going to do is actually I'm going to cheat a little bit, um, and I already have some commits on how to extend my uh, the REST resource class, uh, and I'll show you uh, what's currently in there before I apply the content. So if I hit send, implement REST state get. And if once I if I open up presentation mode is great until you want to read a word, um, but you can see here in my module it generates a plugin REST resource right here as I declared, and you can see that there's um, it's already set up my namespace. This doc block actually defines your REST resource, so it's really really important to have it uh, set up correctly, and that it allows you to actually create different REST resources from there. I'm extending the REST resource base. And I have some additional classes that kind of help me pull in. But, 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 but. but the key part is that you have these sweet methods. For each individual method, you can actually post to the REST resource or get or whatever. So here we have get. And you can see here, I'm doing a little permission check. And I have access uh, to these new classes that allow me to return it. So this one is a REST resource response. 
implement rest state get. So what I'm going to do is git stash, <laughs> git checkout. I think I want stone thing. And did this add it? No, it did not. Let's move on to the next step. Hmm. One moment, please. Great. Perfect. Cool. Um, so here I've cheated. Instead of typing stuff out, uh, I've just checked out my next commit. But what I've done here is I've added actually the database as a service within my REST resource so I can start querying the database and building out my custom query. Um, and because we're also sending files over, if you remember, we committed to actually sending woo, the full file path over uh, here. Um, I'll actually need the public stream wrapper class to generate the file path. And so I've set them the uh, database query method, I've set that as a little variable, the file path, I have a file dir here, and I'll be able to kind of control it here. Then once you have all of your services built in and put in here, um, then you can actually start building out. So what I want to do now is build out the full REST resource response, which I have done in step eight. Boop, great. So all I've done here is extend out the get method. Um, and what I'm doing is I'm looping it within a try catch block that if I fail to catch it, I'm going to throw a bad request HTTP exception. There are a lot of different ways to actually return an exception uh, when handling a REST resource. And so you can really tailor it to whatever you need. In the end, it's going to set the header properly for you and it's going to provide a contextual method for your front end guy to actually handle it. Um, here, if you've ever worked with uh, database queries before in Drupal 7 uh, or 8, it's fairly standard. What I'm doing is I'm just connecting up um, the node field data with a handful of different fields with my joins. And then here for each added field or add expression, I'm going to add an additional um, parameter to my endpoint. So I have the title, which I've mapped out, the artist, with which I've mapped out, and you can see that I've included expressions. When dealing with large data sets or um, more complex calculations in which you kind of want to optimize the query a bit more, having a direct database query is useful to actually tweak and test performance because you can add these expressions and do min, max calculations. I can format dates properly just in line within the query um, or I can do uh, just replacements of text. This won't always be the fastest way, but if you do this directly by hand, you're going to have more control and you're going to be able to tweak and actually optimize the output to whatever your data needs are. And this is definitely something that one can do. Um, a lot of this, this example, can be used uh, with the JSON API, GraphQL, but if you have really weird data, if it's denormalized, if you're doing interesting joins, and if you want to have something that like really kind of can be tailored to your use cases, I really, really like just doing a database query myself and then kind of handling it. Um, I'm also one of those people that like whenever they have a good dessert, they like make the dessert at home so they can get it just right, so I'm just picky. Um, the benefit here, uh, if you want to start kind of debugging everything that's going on, is I can actually take the query, do, 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 query, execute, and this is the get string query. This will actually get a string representation of your query that you can drop into um, whatever database you're using. Uh, you can drop it into PHPStorm, which I use. You can drop it directly into your console. And then you can, using MySQL's explain method, you can actually step through and see where your complicated joins are and see where you're wasting time or space. So it's really, really useful to kind of get in there, nitty, nitty gritty, and kind of massage it. Um, the final step uh, here, I'm getting the albums. This returns an associated array of albums. And uh, what I'm doing here is I'm generating a REST resource. Uh, if you haven't used PHP Storm or any object oriented notation, um, this kind of funny comment gives context to the object. So, uh, so here I'm saying the var response is a REST resource, and that allows me to have PHP Storm ooh, get my type hints. So I can actually see the different content that's in there and what I can use. The awesome thing about the REST resource, or sorry, resource response, excuse me, 
um, is that uh, you can actually set caching and it's cached by default. And so, you, and you can set cache dependencies using Drupal 8's caching APIs. So it's kind of already built in there for you and you have a lot of control over how it's properly handled. So I can either return a response or I said before a bad HTTP exception and let's see if it worked. Boop, send. I have to flush caches. Shocking. Mm-hmm. Go, go, go. Aha. So let's see if I have an endpoint. Yay! Did it. <laughs> cool. Um, okay, so I have an endpoint, that's great. I have this now cool thing that a machine can consume and now I would like to have an app that hosts on it. So the easiest way to do that is actually to generate a page controller uh, using Drupal, console, Drupal, generate controller, and this is gonna be the page that hosts the app. Um, if you want to embed your app in a block, in a theme function, in whatever, you totally can, but for the purposes of this example, we're just gonna drop it in a page. Um, we found that there's a lot of benefits to actually placing decoupled React applications in blocks, in panels, in however you want it, in paragraphs, whatever. Um, so you can kind of sprinkle this idea of content personalization throughout the site. There we go. So I'm gonna create an action method on my controller. If you haven't seen this before, this is fairly standard Drupal console stuff. It is totally described online really clearly. I'm gonna create a little app. It's gonna be at slash albums. Nope, I don't need to generate any of these for the purposes, but I do need to confirm generation. There we go. So you can see here, it's created a little routing file for me, cutie patootie, and I now have my album controller. And at this point, if I flush caches, flush caches, and go back to slash albums, I'll see nothing because I haven't created an app yet. So I need to talk to Justin. All right. Now I will jump in with a really awkward laptop swap. <laughs> yep. While he's doing that, oh wait, we have a Shira GIF. So I have built my app <laughs> um, and with some questions as you set up. Yep. Um, so I kind of touched on these questions. Um, why not use the core REST module or the JSON API? And I really do think that there's great benefits in using them. Um, you need to plug in with this? Sure. Share my screen? Yeah, yeah. you should log in first. Um, I really do think that there's uh, strong benefits in using core REST in the JSON API, but if you have really oddly structured data, if you have denormalized data, or if you have very large data sets, there is a benefit into minimizing the actual weight of the endpoint and you can do that with a custom query that returns a custom structure. Um, I used a database query. Why not use entity queries? They're cached. Um, again, if you have really complex or interesting or denormalized structure, such as uh, commerce entities, uh, different entities that you have to join together, there can be performance benefits of just you rolling your own query. Uh, finally, about uh, caching and pagination, uh, the REST resource class allows you uh, sorry, the resource response class allows you to actually handle caching yourself and any queries that you choose to use, whether it's entity query or the database query, you can roll pagination yourself. So it allows you to kind of tailor and customize the content as you need. You ready? No, I'm done. I talked through the whole slideshow. <laughs> okay. All right. Just skip through it then. Okay. So I, I basically am resuming where Aaron left off. Um, just in case things blow up, I have that part working. Uh, but great job, Aaron. Um, so, so we have the, the JSON feed here. We'll just refresh to confirm that it's working. Okay, good. We have the album page. Nothing on it right now. <clears throat> and we have like a little scaffolding app here that I set up. That's the, the app that I'll probably make public in the near future. Um, so basically what we want to do is switch back to slideshow here. Da, 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 da. 
da, da, da. There we go. There we go. So it's, as we said before, it's progressively decoupled. So we're not, it's not running on another server. It's, it's basically embedding in the page. So that's why I use the phrase embedding. We're gonna, we're gonna add it to the page that Aaron created. So this is basically what we're gonna do. Uh, quick prayer to the live demo gods. So hopefully things go smoothly. Uh, I'm going to, I'm actually not gonna clone React because um, I don't wanna rely on the Wi-Fi. Uh, I've seen some problems with that. So I basically have that kind of all set up, ready to go. I'm gonna do an overview of sort of the scaffolding app that I'm gonna use. Uh, it's a, a Redux, React Redux app. Has anyone here worked with React or Redux? Maybe a quick show of hands. How many for Redux? Okay, so a few. So hopefully uh, this will be interesting for you guys that haven't seen that before. Redux is just a way of managing your application state. Uh, it's kind of our chosen way that we like to do things. It simplifies a lot of things. So I'm gonna go through sort of the architecture there, uh, the justification for why things are organized the way they are. Um, Redux is pretty opinionated, but there's some benefits you get from that. Uh, and then I'm going to basically attach the app to the page, and we do that by creating a library, a uh, YAML file, uh, and then we'll maybe tweak the app a little bit, depending on how much time we have, and see how far we can take it. I do have some, some branches at my disposal. If we run out of time, I can check those out, and I can show you sort of a finished product, or the uh, cooked turkey, using the cooking show metaphor. So I'm gonna switch back to uh, PHP Storm here. Oops. And I'm not a fan of presentation mode, but I'm gonna try it. <laughs> All right, here. So, uh, so what I did is I took uh, Aaron's app, basically, and I created a little JS folder. I cloned my scaffolding repo into it, uh, renamed it Master of the Universe, uh, and then we ha basically have a starting point. So what the scaffolding app is, is it's basically a simple React app. It fetches data from a remote endpoint and displays, uh, loops through it, assumes it's an array, loops through it, and displays some properties. So sort of the, the use case where we'd use this is maybe a, a substitution for views. Uh, to, like as Aaron said earlier, typically with views, you change your search filters, and it has to make a request to the server, make the full round trap round trip back, update your results. Uh, that can be a slow process. Even a second or two can feel slow if, you're, uh, if you want a real snappy experience for your, for your customers or, or whoever, for your site users. So what we're doing is basically loading all the data up front and doing the filter purely client side. So we have all the data stored in the state of our application and then we can filter on it there, which means uh, you can do things, you can do the filtering very quickly essentially. Um, so I'm just gonna walk through the structure of the app first. Um, so those of you who've done React would probably recognize some of this stuff, it's pretty standard. We have like a, a gulp file that grabs all your components, all your JavaScript files and merges them together and minifies them. That's what we'll essentially be adding to, to the page, uh, at, to the library. Um, the package.json file, that's, you can almost think of it uh, as your make file coming from Drupal speak, a list of your dependencies. Um, and we'll show that real quick. So these are all the node packages that I'm gonna pull in to use. Uh, some, of them, some of them I probably don't need, um, but basically, it, yeah, it's all your dependencies. Um, now, this is kind of standard React stuff. The components, components in React are sort of, you can think of them as little snippets of markup, um, little, little widgets, little pieces. It can be it's something as simple as a div, a single div. It can be like a full, it could be a full application managing its own state and everything. Uh, in my case, I just have sort of a wrapping component called app, uh, and then the main component. So I'm gonna open up main component. And every component in React uh, needs to have at least one method, which is the render, and that kind of returns your markup. Uh, now markup in React is actually called JSX. It's like a pseudo HTML. It's, it looks like HTML, but it's not. So you can say, you can add classes to it, you know, as you would uh, in HTML, of course, we have to use special words like class name. Uh, class is you know, a reserved word in JavaScript, so we kind of have a, a replacement for it here. Um, so this is where I'm actually looping through the data and printing out all the different uh, properties. Um, so that's sort of the front end component of it. 
Um, now where it gets into more of the, I guess, redux land is these things called actions and reducers. Um, an action is basically defining a way that you can modify your state. Um, any, anytime you, the user interacts with it, they're sort of creating an action. So you want to attach uh, actions as callbacks on, say, a button click or a filter change or those sorts of things. Um, and th those are the ways that you modify your state. The reducers are sort of slices of your state. So in this case, I have a data reducer. So that's the data I'm going to get from the endpoint. Um, when the app first loads, there's a default state. So everything's basically, you can see, null. I'm not fetching. It's not loaded. There's no errors. Uh, these, these properties are sort of flags that I'll use in my app. So when, thing, when the AJAX request is in processing, when it's, when it's processing, I can you know, set that to true, and the, the, uh, the component can render uh, a loading message or something to that effect. Um, down here below, I have the function, which is sort of uh, essentially listening for these actions. So when you uh, dispatch an action, say, from a button click, uh, it fires, uh, fires the action with this sort of a name, and then we can react to it here. Um, what we're doing with a reducer is we're taking the state and we're modifying it. But one of the properties or principles of Redux is that you're not mutating the, st the state. They're actually pure functions, which means you need to return a new state. And that's sort of actually one of the benefits of Redux. Um, the way it manages state allows you to sort of push onto the state stack. Um, you can then get a history of state. You can have undo functions. You can record events. You can actually track every piece of interaction that the user does, which is really interesting for marketers, too. It gives, gives them a lot of analytic data. Let me take a drink real quick. Um, you can see this one comment I put here. Something called uh, object spread. So that's sort of new to ES7. Uh, spread operator is pretty cool. What it does is sort of explodes out your object or your an array, uh, returning all the different properties. And then anything listed after it actually sort of overrides the existing one. So what we're essentially doing here is saying, OK, when we get our data back, we want our original state. But we want to update our data with the data we got back. And then we want to set these flags. Um, so that's sort of the reducer. And the actions are where we actually define those things that can happen. So I have a few actions here. Um, first one is get data. That's sort of a wrapper that will call the other, the other actions, which I have lift, listed below here. Um, so you know, the data can be fetching. We can get it back. Um, You'll notice that this first one here is the only one that has an export, which means this is the only one we're going to make available to the app. So the, the component's going to call get data. Uh, you can see I'm using Ajax or, uh, jQuery Ajax here. Could have done it another way, but I think everyone's familiar with uh, jQuery, so kept it simple. So it's actually going to set our flag as pending. It's going to fetch some data. I'm going to have to update this to, uh, to the uh, URL that Aaron set up, and then when when it's done, we're going to pass the data, which is our response, uh, to, to the reducer, which will update the state. And one of the beauty things of React is that when the state changes, it'll actually re-render the component. So when we initially render the component, it, we don't have data, so we display a loading message. As Soon as we get the data back, uh, it will actually re-render it with it. So you don't have to sort of manually tell the component to, to re-render. It'll, it'll just sort of happen. Um, some of this other stuff is sort of boilerplate stuff for Redux. The store is basically the, uh, where all the state is managed. It's the, the single source of truth, as it were. Uh, with other architectures in React, you can kind of have the individual components managing their own state, which is called local state. That doesn't always scale very well. It can get really unruly. Uh, we've, we've built applications without Redux. And as you have different components, things build up, build up, and you're it gets very complicated sharing state between components, getting them all to work together. Uh, it becomes difficult to track. Um, so with Redux, um, it has everything all in one spot, which makes it really nice for debugging. And there's some great Chrome uh, extensions that are for React, and there's one for Redux, too. And I'll show a bit of more of those later. Um, yeah, I, I won't go any further into that. Um, so let's actually update our URL here. going to update our fetching URL. Oh, that's hard to 
see. Yeah, that's Hold on. So I'm going to just replace the dummy URL that I had there. And I'm going to update our response because I believe there was a root of albums. So that's good. And then over here. That looks good. And let's do Oh. Yeah, sorry. Even bigger? All right. Just keep yelling at me tilts. Is that good? No. Oh wow. Okay. How's that? <laughs> no? What happened there? There we go. Okay, so that built. So now if I flip back to here, uh, what it did is put our uh, compiled file in here, our app.js. So that's what we're going to attach to our page. How am I doing for time? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? Okay, cool. Uh, so the next thing we want to do, now that we actually have a JavaScript file, we want to attach it to the page. So I'm going to create uh, masters of the universe dot libraries. Ah, live coding. <laughs> okay. And rather than make you watch me type that out, I'll just uh, copy and paste that little snippet somewhere over here. My cheat sheet. <laughs> um, so I'm basically just pasting in uh, the definition of the library. And, and it's sensitive to the tabbing, so let me just correct that. Okay, so now we have a library. It's pointing to our, uh, our app. And now we want to actually add it to the page. So I have another one for that. So in the page controller that Aaron created, uh, there's basically just a render array callback. And we just want to attach it to that. Oops. There we go. Page controller. That looks good. Okay. And let's go back to here. Let's see what we get. There we go. So what's that what is what, it was pretty fast, but what's actually happening is the page loads, then the JavaScript executes, it uh, hits Aaron's API that she set up, retrieves all the data, then we loop through it displaying all the titles. So at this point, we haven't really done anything that views can't do. Uh, it is pretty snappy. Uh, but what I want to do next is actually add like search searchability to it so we can filter it really quickly. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to show you some of the Chrome extensions we have. Uh, they're pretty neat. So there's the plain vanilla React one. Uh, it's kind of like the DOM inspector, but it just shows you the React stuff. So you can sort of see here's what it's basically printing out. It's just a bunch of divs. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, can I zoom? Yeah. There we go. Um, so available to our component, we have our data, which you can see here, and our action. So those are the two, the two things that we've exposed. Uh, but now I'm going to uh, add some search stuff to it. I'm going to have to update my URL again real quick because I discarded my changes. Oh, and Gulp Watch, forgot about that. Gulp basically it monitors for file changes and will rebuild so I don't have to keep flipping back here. And we're 
spots dot albums. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the uh, the difference. So what I did is I created a, a little on that commit. I created an input on key up. It calls the search title uh, function, which is right here, and all that's doing is calling our action, which is a search title action. So if I flip over to our action creators. <clears throat> I create a new one here. It's exported. It just defines it, so it's called the search title action, and it returns uh, just the search term. And the search term is just the uh, the value that the user typed in. So they type, dispatches the action, passes it to the reducer. Uh, the reducer then does some filtering. Take a look here. So here's my search function uh, right here. So I just wrote like a little one line searcher. So it, Kind of a neat little thing I learned. Uh, index of, if you use this operator, will sort of turn it into a truthy value. So index of usually returns a character position, but this returns it to a true or false. So what we're actually doing is looping through our data. I've added a new property to our state called filtered data. So we now have all our data and then the, the subset, which is the filtered data. And it's filtering based on uh, this, this little function here. We then update our state, update the filtered data. So we, we, we never want to override the original data because that's sort of our, our whole repository of information. The filtered data is what we're always operating with. Uh, and then if I flip back to my main component, I'm now looping through the filtered data as opposed to the, 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 the main data. And if I flip back to my app, we'll see if it works. There we go, okay. So now, if I type, it should actually filter as I type without any uh, Ajax requests. So it's completely client side. See how it works. There we go. So um, it's pretty simple use case, but it's, it's pretty snappy, it's really neat. So typically what in this kind of architecture, what we're actually filtering is, uh, in the example Aaron showed you, was uh, a vacation site. So they're not dealing with 25 albums, they're actually dealing with thousands of permutations of different destinations and different, different vacations. And so we find it actually really useful to be able to filter quickly. It's, uh, it's a nice experience for the user to kind of not wait for that round trip back and forth to the server. Um, I see we're running short on time, so maybe I'll just check out the finished version. So what I did is here is actually have like a little clever cover flow component. So um, coming from like a, a Drupal background, um, Drupal dev developer by trade, um, I always kind of find it interesting searching the D.O for a module. You know, there's a module for that. NPM is pretty similar. It's always fun looking for something. So I actually just Googled React cover flow and sure enough, there's a component for it. So if I flip back to my thing here. in my main component. So what I've done here is I've <clears throat> just wrapped, uh, sorry, when I loop through my filtered data, um, I'm actually just printing out the images instead of the titles, and then I'm wrapping it in this cover flow uh, component. And that basically does all the heavy lifting. I haven't written any CSS. Um, I've just basically made this little change that you see right here, so it's purely a front end thing. And I'll rebuild my app. We'll see if that works. Oh, I guess I did that already. Ah, there we go. <laughs> okay. And we'll try and refresh that again. Oh, zoom out. There we go. And if I update it. Let it re-render a bit. Oh, so I filtered it down to one. There we go. And I can scroll through it. Um, and one last thing I'll show you. So there's, in addition to the React DevTools, there's the Redux DevTools. 
And basically, that gives you some Redux-specific tooling, which is really nice. Uh, it can show you your history, so you can actually see everything that I did. I can go backwards and forwards in time. So I could actually skip back to when the app was initializing. I can click jump, and look, the whole app went back to the initial state. And I can go back to search here, and there's the, the state again. So it's actually really useful for debugging the Redux toolbar. I don't even really use the React one. Um, it also has a diff, so you can see the, the diff between your state changes. Uh, you can record the state changes, export them, whatever. Uh, we often just push the entire state to some marketing uh, you know, data layer of some kind, so they find that very valuable. So you can get really fine-grained uh, reporting on what users are doing, which is really useful. Um, all right. Yeah, I'll wrap it up on that. Um, we got, what, a couple minutes? There we go. Yay. <laughs> so we have a couple minutes. I don't know if, if we want to open up to questions. We could maybe skim over these. What do you, what do you think? Sure. Um, yeah, if there are any specific questions that you want to come up, uh, ask them. I got a question. How? Um, what would it take to uh, get React to render on the server so that it's not purely client, so it's like actually uh, working React out? can be rendered server-side. I um, mean in Drupal, sorry. <laughs> in Drupal? Uh, we, I actually haven't done that. That's okay. an interesting idea. Yeah, that's um, I know it can be done. Yeah. Uh, in, in, this, in this sense, we um, yeah. Haven't, yeah, haven't really done it, but cool. you I, would probably, I know it can be done. <laughs> I would have to imagine, and maybe somebody with more uh, DevOps, DevOps experience with node environments could jump in to add sure. to this. Yeah. Um, but it would be have to be part of your build process or yeah. any kind of cron job. Cool. Thanks. Yep. How's it going? Hi. Going? Good. Quick question about uh, the site that you actually built with uh, React and um, and Drupal. So the the travel site. That we yeah, showed the travel earlier? site. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So in um, with Redux, you get all your like data on the client. And I was wondering, with like thousands of, of like nodes coming through, how do you do you uh, do you get everything at one time, or maybe everything fifty at a time, and then like when you need to get the next Good fifty, question. do you render? Uh, we do paginate it. Mm -hmm. um, so what you could do is have the app render after you get the first page if you want, mm -hmm. and have the results filtering in. We we tend to wait for all the results to come in before we show customers, especially when it's pricing sensitive. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we do paginate for large data sets. Oh, okay. um, and optimizing the endpoints so you can have a really lean data set we found is important. So mm -hmm. we only tend to send information over that we need on the front end mm -hmm. um, so you don't bloat it, so you can send more um, results. Yeah, that's kind of why we don't always use JSON API because mm -hmm. it sends you everything yeah. and it gives you the full field name and you, know, you, don't, you don't really need the UID or the publish date for, yeah. for some of those nodes. So mm -hmm. we keep it lean, we keep the payload small, cache it, uh, and it's actually, even with you know thousands and thousands, it's still a pretty snappy experience. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thanks. Yeah. 